Hello, everybody. This is episode 298, and my guest today is Jennifer Hale, who turned 60 years old on the day of her cerebrovascular accident, also known as a CVA. A CVA is described as a condition where a portion of the brain experiences a lack of blood flow, resulting in damage to brain tissue. This occurrence is typically instigated by either blood clots or ruptured blood vessels within the brain. Symptoms are associated with cerebrovascular accidents encompass sensations of dizziness, numbness, weakness localized to one side of the body and difficulties in speech and writing or language comprehension. Now, just before we get started with the interview, let me tell you a little bit about my book for a minute. It's called The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened, and it lists 10 tools for recovery and personal transformation. It also tells the story of 10 stroke survivors and the steps they took that got them to the stage in their recovery, where from a personal growth perspective, stroke transformed into one of those life experiences that on reflection was filled with many opportunities for growth and personal transformation. In the book, there are chapters on nutrition, sleep, exercise, how to deal with the emotional side of stroke, tips and tools for mental well-being, and much, much more. To find out more, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book, grab a copy from Amazon by typing in my name, Bill Gassiamas, into the search bar. Jennifer Hale, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you, Bill? I'm well. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Okay. Um, It happened on March the 6th, which was my 60th birthday. (laughs) Um, I was fine. You know, I was getting birthday calls that morning. By 10 o'clock, my daughter rushed me to emergency because I was, I couldn't keep my balance and I was dizzy. And my my face kept um, slanting, but I didn't think nothing serious until we got there, of course. So I ended up having a, I can't pronounce it. It was a small blood clot in the left side of my brain. The one that starts with an I, I can't pronounce it. Uh, acute ischemic CVA is what you've written here. Yes. Yes, that's what it was. Okay. Yes. And uh, it was your 60th birthday. Now, it's March right now. So right. how many years ago was that? That was last year, 2023. So, so I'll be 61 in five days. more days. Yeah, and this is a kickoff celebration for me. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so are you somebody that has that has um, a thing with anniversaries? There's some stroke survivors who, when the anniversary of the stroke is coming up, they start to get nervous or they start to uh, think about it in a negative way. Um, But there's a lot of stroke survivors who don't have a problem with anniversaries at all. They don't believe that that the anniversary means anything other than to mark 12 months. How do you feel about the anniversary that's coming up? Because it's supposed to be a celebration because it's your birthday. Yeah, it was all sweet. Last year when there was, I had maybe six to 10 doctors in the room watching me to see what I was doing. And every time they say, what's your name? I tell them my name. What's your birthday? March the 6th, 1963. And they'll look, oh, no, that's the day. I said, no, today's my birthday. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> Just wish me a happy birthday. <laughs> and I'm still celebrating. <laughs> I didn't I didn't feel like, I, I guess to make a long story short, I didn't want the pity party. I didn't want nobody feeling sorry for me because I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. Uh-huh. So I didn't want nobody to say happy birthday, join my party. If you didn't want to stay, you're welcome to leave. 
but we're not having a a pity party. <laughs> I appreciate so I that. still feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. It's a great way to think about it and to go uh, about how to deal with something serious that's happening on a particular day. It doesn't matter which day it is, whether it was your birthday yeah. or not, really, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And then, you know, by it being the, the 60th, that's a milestone. So I celebrate, I was celebrating just to be breathing still on my 60th birthday yeah i didn't have sunrise at 3 6 63 sundown at 3 6 2023 no <laughs> i'm still here <laughs> yeah yeah that's the way i say too i my i was 37 when all of the stuff that happened to me happened and i'm just glad that i'm getting to 50 this year is going to be my 50th and it's oh, really cool. It's yeah. really cool to be here, right? Because 13 right. years earlier, I don't know. I don't know if I would have um, got there. That's the thing. It's right. a real right. gift to have another 13 years. And I'm not sure how many more I'll have, but these 13 have been really uh, lovely to have because some yes. great things have happened, even though there's been some terrible things happen in life, just uh, as everyone's life, um, yeah. it's been good to be around. Yes, yes. Well, I appreciate you still being here because from the, when I got home, my daughter had gave me your information just to kind of get a little bit more of what's going on with me. So I've been watching you for over a year now and every episode that i catch is just so inspiring so i'm glad you're still here too <laughs> wow that's awesome that's lovely i really appreciate yeah. that your daughter yeah. and was that your son that we were uh chatting with earlier my son-in-law my son-in-law son -in tell yes. me about your daughter and your family uh how, how big is the family who's around what uh what's that like well I'm living with my oldest daughter and my son-in-law, and it's three. I have three grandchildren here, but I'm a grandmother of six grandchildren, and I have three kids, two boy, I mean, two girls and a boy, and they all in their forties. So yeah, so it's 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 been a learning experience for the whole family, but I try to keep them informed on. Whatever I learn about myself, I try to inform them because they're not used to me in this way. But I tell them this is the new me and we all just have to adapt to it as much because I'm, I'm surprised just like you. <laughs> so I'll just keep everybody informed, even the kids, keep them informed and what's going on with me. Yeah, so we're adjusting pretty good. Yeah. And your children, are they all living near you? The others? I know you're living with your daughter, but are the others living near you? No, I have a daughter in South Carolina and I have a son in North Carolina. And we're in Alabama, so we're all kind of... <laughs> yeah. Everyone's all over the place. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and do they get... Do you guys get to meet up and catch up and have family events at Christmas or at the big uh, uh, holidays. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. 
It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Well, this year, I kind of opt out of everything because I couldn't. I'm still sensitive to noise, mm -hmm. crowds, and um, I only could take so much light. Then I have to have enough light, like certain times of the day, I need more light than when I'm kind of relaxing. I don't need that much light, but it just depends on my body. So I just follow whatever my body said to do. I respect my body. So I didn't have any celebrations, which was okay, because I needed to rest and, you know. Yeah. I remember opting out of a lot of social events as well. And then at some stage feeling like I'm missing out. So I would go along for as long as I could and then sometimes sleep on their, their bed or their couch <laughs> and sometimes just leave early just go to yeah. their place and yeah. set the expectation that we're going to come for a few hours we're going to see everybody and then we're going to leave and get home early yeah. and that started to get better after two years after three years after four years everything started to settle down and I was able to be at an event for as long as I felt like it or as long as I wanted and fatigue wasn't the thing that was causing me to not want to be there or to go home. And of course, noise sensitivity was an issue and all the overstimulation from all the people laughing and chatting and having a great yes. time. It was yes. all uh, yes. a bit too much. And I think it's the wise decision to say, Hey, you guys have a good time, but I'm going to rest. I'm going to sit this one out and then, I might see you at the yes. next one. Yes, yes. Yeah, my um, my son, my grandson, he was six at the time. He was playing football during the summer, and his sisters were the cheerleaders, and they were seven and eight. He asked me, 10 and eight, seven. And I missed the whole game except the last one. I forced myself to go so I can at least say I went to one. But I had to put the earplugs in my ear and you know, at the time and get on a cane in the whole night. Off. Well, when it got too much, I had to go. But I did get to see one of their games and my they were cheerleading. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it was worth the struggle, it was worth the it effort. Was. Uh, it was. Yeah, the children would have loved to have you there. Everyone would have loved to see you out and about. And the good thing about it is you made some, you took some precautions. You put the earplugs in and then you used your cane. You did whatever you had to do to get there. And then when it was enough, it was enough. It was enough. Yeah, come home, put, put, <laughs> put the cane to the side and lay down. <laughs> yeah. And rest yeah. up. Were you <laughs> actively up. employed when you had your stroke? What were you doing uh, for? For what were you doing on a day to day basis? Excuse me. At the time, I was working a part time job and going to school full time online. I was a full time student, which I still am. I, mean, I was blessed enough with the instructors let me. They extended my time when I was in rehab to do my work online. And so when they did that, only my left side is my side that went out. So I just had my right side and I was just doing what I could until, and I made my dates and I made my scores, my points, and I'm back in school. <laughs> I'm back in school now. From That's last excellent. year, had a break, summer break, and I just recently started back eight weeks ago. What are you studying? I'm studying uh, Christ Christian counseling. Yeah. Wow. So how much longer have you got until that's complete? Oh, wow. 
I just started when all this happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it'd be a while. Three, maybe another three and a half years. Yeah. Okay. If not four, because I'm going part time now. I'm not doing full time. Yeah. I'm gonna drop it to part time. Yeah. And will that allow yeah. you to do what when you're uh when you're qualified? What is the hope? What kind of role will you be able to participate in? I can I can um counsel in church, you know, or I can have my own um place or office in council you know my goal what I really would like to do is counsel children and be uh, a part of the younger kids and growing up and helping them through their decisions and all that kind of stuff but yeah I can counsel at the time when I get done are you doing Christian counseling because you were very active in your local church? Well, um, the church that I attend now is my daughter and son in laws church. I just got it. I'm not involved still because once again, it's the hyper. And But before I decided Christian counseling because, I mean, um, years ago, I used to be very active in the church. And I used to do counseling in the church, but it wasn't what I expected. Um, how can I explain it? It was more, um, it wasn't enough for me. It wasn't enough. I didn't feel like it was awarding enough to the people I was trying to help. So I wanted to get more information on how to use the skills on helping people instead of just letting a person talk, talk, to talk, and we never get to a, a solution. So I wanted to learn the skills and what to use and what to say to help a person really get to the bottom of their situation. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. But... <laughs> it sounds like yeah. you were doing your best to help people. You felt like perhaps you could help them more and better, and you made a decision to get get um, qualified in the particular field so that you could right. offer a better, uh, like you were thinking about the people you were helping. You wanted to make sure that you were able to support them to get an outcome rather than right. just attend and, and, and perhaps not get to an end point. Right, exactly. That's the perfect, the end point, because we can go around the same mm. circle and never get to the, to the bottom of it and that's that's not my goal i wanted to make sure i was helping somebody so what happened at the time of the stroke you experienced the symptoms you went to hospital they checked you out how long did you stay in hospital and uh then how long were you in rehabilitation um i stayed in the hospital i think I want to say 10 days, if I remember straight. And I had a little bit of um, rehab there. They walked me around. And then I went to rehab, and I was in a um, inpatient rehab for almost three months or oh, two months, I think. I can't remember. Then I was on outpatient until another month or two and then insurance no more so but that didn't stop me what i did was um i would get on youtube and look for exercises to help and i would exercise and then i i went to the y and got in the pool and worked on my legs and my arms and anything that would give me movement i did it to this day, I haven't, I don't have insurance at this time because it's between moving from one state to another and still trying to get my disability together, it's, it's kind of hard to get it all connected. So the only thing I do now is just make sure I eat right, exercise, 
and do everything I can to keep my body in shape. Yeah. They're good things to do. So you were in therapy uh, until the insurance ran out and then you yes. went you went home. When you went home, what did you go home with? What kind of challenges were you experiencing? My left leg, it would drag. So I had to tell my brain to pick up my leg when, when I was walking. My I named my left arm, I named it Baby. So Baby was pent to my side. She was not moving at all. And uh, only time she would move is when I yarn and she would go straight up, but then she'd come down. But after the rehab, I didn't have any movement. My movement didn't really start until I joined the Y and started swimming, well, not swimming, but moving in the pool. And then one day, my daughter was getting ready to go to work. And I already knew I could lift my arm, and I told her bye. And she was like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's moving. <laughs> so it's almost 90% now. I, I just can't move it on top of my head. My leg is strong. It don't drag. But every now and then I have to tell it to, you know, get let's going. go. Yeah, get going. And the only thing now, of course, is my I can't pronounce it, you know, when you try to talk, it's aphasia. 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 And every now and then, my, I lose track of thinking. You know, I can't think too fast because everything just stops. Mm -hmm. But outside appearance is coming along pretty good, but now it's more inside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the healing on the inside of the brain inside of the brain and my eyes yeah but how how are your eyes affected bleary i can't it's real like dusty mm. dusty yeah and they said the blood call was really really small it wasn't enough for them to operate it was really really small so okay um, but um, when I was in the rehab, inpatient rehab, and I would watch everybody that was in there with me, and I would thank God that it could have been worse. But it's just amazing on what a stroke can do to a body. <laughs> it's just amazing when you see the different effects on it. How would you say you're different? You say that. Uh, your speech, uh, if you think too quickly, everything stops. So is your speech affected by that as well? Are you talking at a slower pace than perhaps you would have before? Yes. Yes. Real slow. Sometimes I have to think about what I'm going to say before I say it. Else it just sounds like I'm rattling. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. So now the thinking has to happen. And then once you've gathered the thought, then you can say it. Before, you yes. just used to talk and it used to come it out and there was no thinking about what you had to say. No. <laughs> but I really have to think about what I'm going to say now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why do you believe that the therapy didn't start for your left side, that you didn't get much stronger while you were in rehab and then you started to see improvements when you got home can you do you have a theory on that did you do something different when you came home to be honest i think the difference was once i moved to alabama um where i'm at now they just completely health everything spinach this and smoothies and a lot of berries and and so the household is full with nothing but healthy snacks and well healthy food period and how you said turmeric 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 season turmeric I think that that and walnuts did it because <laughs> that's all I really eat 
and all of a sudden seemed like everything just started, you know, relaxing, I guess. And then being in the swimming pool helps because my muscles wasn't feeling anything. So I can move and still have resistance and it wasn't hurt. Mm -hmm. I remember the swimming pool was really water. Yeah. I remember the swimming pool was really lovely to be in uh, after the stroke, even though I couldn't walk and move my left side either. Uh, of course, I was supported by the therapists and uh, with um, with those flotation devices. So I was feeling right. safe being in there, but I was able to exert myself as much as possible and get that resistance from yeah. the water and then also not be afraid that I was going to fall over and hurt myself. Right, right. Yeah, I think that was it because you can't – if. I, if you're at three feet, you're not going, <laughs> you can't go too far, you know. But it was good to have that resistance. That's the part that I like, knowing I can move around and know I'm not going to hurt myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult for the children to see you in the way that they saw you? How did they support you? And they all live in different places. And it sounds like you were living somewhere else at that time as well. Where were you living? I was living with my daughter in South Carolina. Uh, well, let me back up because I know I saw. Um, right before the pandemic, 2019, I flew. I stayed in California. <laughs> but I flew to South Carolina to be with my son and his birthday. And then everything shut down. So that's what made me stay here because <laughs> I, could, I couldn't go home. I said, well, my kids and grandkids are here, so might as well hang around. So that's what, how it truly happened. And then the daughter I was staying with in South Carolina, I was living with her. And it was just a blessing because she worked night shift and she was asleep when I was going through the dizzy spells and all that. And I te I called her, she didn't answer. And I texted her and I said, oh, well, and I was just getting ready to take a nap. So don't take a nap, stay up. So I stayed up Then my daughter ran up the stairs and she said, Ma, you look like you getting ready. Cause I was in the mirror looking at myself. And she said, you look like you're gonna have a, you're having a stroke. And I said, oh, okay and I was real calm she said let's go and I said okay wait let me let me comb my hair she said no you don't have time to comb your hair you gotta go I said oh, you don't know who we're gonna see when I get there I gotta it's my birthday I gotta make sure I'm looking nice. so she got me there and thank the lord everything was okay <laughs> but yeah <laughs> And then your other two children were not near you. They get the news. How did they respond? They was at the hospital. My son at the time, he couldn't make it, but he kept calling. But my daughter, mm. they came. Yeah, they was at the hospital. My sisters and fathers flew out from California. So I had a lot of support in the beginning until, you know, yeah. You got one I of those. still have support. You've got one of those big families that uh, when something goes wrong, everyone just turns up. <laughs> At the rehab, they say, you like a movie star around here. <laughs> you like a movie star around here. I said, well, that's my family. They like shy about nothing. <laughs> yeah, so. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're the matriarch as well. It sounds like you're the head of the family and a lot of things happen because people look up to you and they respect you and probably your attitude, it sounds like has always been your attitude. I don't think that this is new for you, this way about solving problems and overcoming challenges. I, I don't feel like you just started this. Has that always been you? Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I'm the oldest of eight. <laughs> 
And I'm not, okay, we're so close in age that I never felt like I was the oldest because we're that close in age. I will always be there to support whatever they needed or whatever they needed from me. So, and then, yeah, to answer your question, negativity was never my thing. If you didn't have anything positive to say, as they used to say, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. So yeah, it's, I, I believe it's too much in life to be disappointed about things that's not going to matter a minute from now, you know? If you can make the best of it, do it, you know? If you can't, figure it out. <laughs> but no, I never, no. You know, I'm not going to say I don't have bad days, because I do, but I let it taste it take its course, but it don't settle. It don't settle in long enough for me to feel sorry for myself. That's a very good example. With the aphasia, was it worse before uh, this particular interview? Has it improved? What have you noticed has changed with the way that you communicate now? It definitely improved a whole lot. Because in the beginning, all of this was over here. And a friend of mine told me, he said, chew gum, just chew gum, and you're going to find that you eventually your side is going to kind of even out. And I did. I used to chew like sticks, sticks after sticks, and I still chew it, you know. But he was right. Eventually, it came. And that I had exercises that they gave me that I still do. I say my ABCs. And when I read a book, I read out loud. So, I, you know, the more I use it, the better it gets. But sometimes I, I don't like to hear myself. To me, I sound like a robot. So after a while, I just get quiet because I don't like that part. And then... um. When I'm ready for it, I exercise some more, but but it's much better to answer your question, yes. So you hear yourself in your ears like a robot. Did you ever hear like a robot? Did you ever notice yourself being aware that you can hear yourself before? Does that make sense? Do you know when you're talking? I've never actually paid attention to my the sound of my own voice. Sometimes people will say you love the sound of your own voice if you're the kind of person who talks a lot and is chatting all the time. <laughs> and and I've always said, yeah, I do like the sound of my own voice, but I haven't paid attention to it. Are you saying that what happens now is your the sound of your voice comes into your awareness and then as a result of that, is it, and it does that because it's, sounds strange it sounds strange it sounds just like a little like um uh yeah it just sounds strange i can't even explain it like an electronic it's voice like, yeah perfect just like that yeah and, and do other people's voices sound like that to you or is it just your own voice that sounds like that just my own voice just my own voice, yeah. With other people, you only can talk for so long, then I have to, I can't talk, take a break. If I'm around somebody who talk, 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 you have to take a break. And I, I never, that never bothered me before, because you know, communication is the key but now I'm very in tune with conversations and if it's a conversation that I feel like it's not meaningful or it's not productive if I could say that in other words I don't want to just hear you talk <laughs> You know, it got to be some some information to what we're talking about, or I just. 
There has to be yeah. a point to the conversation, not just chin point. wagging. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's like that? it. That's an Australian I, I saying. Like that. Oh, what is it said again? Chin wagging. Chin chin wagging. I'm yeah. gonna borrow. No, I'm not gonna borrow it. I'm gonna say it. You, <laughs> I'm gonna say it if you don't mind. You own it. You own it. So what we do is we, <laughs> We can say something like, let's go for a chin wag. That that means let's go for a talk. Let's go for a bit of a talk. Okay. You know, let's get it. And then um this guy's over here, you could you could say something like, you know, he's just having a chin wag. He's just having a talk, you know, he's just getting things out, he's just saying stuff, you know. Oh, and, okay. And it's just to and it's just to describe what people are doing is that they're more than anything, they're just moving their chin rather than actually having a deep and meaningful or important right. conversation it's just right. it's just a, a term that suggests there's talking going on but there may not be a lot of substance behind it but that's okay. right yeah yeah it yeah it's okay for a little while yeah. and then after a while my brain just shuts down automatically yeah. because i'm not receiving nothing to keep keep it productive you know to keep you stimulated and focused and try to work out what's going on. And then it becomes, it, it sounds like then it becomes just noise. And then that becomes tiring because I, I understand how noise can make the brain tired, especially if it's just for no purpose. Right, right, right. And there's no heart feelings. That's one of the things that I, when I realized that about myself, I called a family meeting with my, my children here and let them know, look, I'm not the same. You know, I'm not, I'm, you know, it used to be time we could talk to two and three in the morning, just, you know, chin wag. <laughs> but no, we can't do that anymore. And you have to make sure what you talk about is in, it's important or is something that's going to be worth listening to because my attention span shuts down real quick and i don't want you to think i'm being rude when i'm not i just have to listen to my head and when it says enough is enough mm. i check out <laughs> and you've got to save that energy for the important conversations so you can have those and pay attention to them and some of the other conversations just take some of that battery energy from that space right 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 it's on reserve i put it on reserve and then i notice if i don't talk all day by the end of the evening i have a lot you can wear me out for a minute but if you start in the morning i'm not gonna last, <laughs> not gonna last. no <laughs> You say it so well. That's so true. That's exactly what I experienced. I was never able to really communicate it. I would just say, look, I'm not interested in talking and um, people might take it the wrong way or, or, or I would just sound like I'm getting overwhelmed or I don't want to hear about it or just don't tell me. I don't want to know. Sounds like you have a better way of letting people know. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm not in the business of trying to hurt people's mm. feelings. I never, you know, I never was, you know, because if I, if it's something about you, I don't care about, I don't set myself up for the, the nonsense. So I try to be front. This is how it is. I'm, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I got to look after what my body is telling me to do, you know. You're a grandmother, so the kids are around from time to time. What is it like when they're around? Because they're full of energy and they want your attention and they want to play and they want to be loud. What's that like? <laughs> In the beginning, like I said, we named it. I named my arm baby. It took a while for them to comprehend what was going on. Because they, um, To be honest, my, all my grandkids, my oldest grandkids, my oldest granddaughter, she calls me Granny. The one under her calls me Ma. And the three around here calls me Grandma Peachy. So they all 
<laughs> they all have their own little name for their their personality and my personality. So they used to seeing Grandma Peachy, you know, she always doing something, you know. But when they seen I couldn't, I sew and I used to make T-shirts, um, printed T-shirts, and I would get them involved. Crafting was my thing. But when they seen I couldn't do it, they was, oh, no, Grandma Peachy. They would be so, and they would all come and rub my arm or, you know, lay their head on my arm. And if we went to the store, they would take my arm, my hand, all three of them would grab one would grab a wrist, one would grab the elbow, one would grab, and they all walked me across the street. They were so attentive in the beginning. When they seen Grandma Peachy could move a little bit, oh, it was over. <laughs> okay, you guys still got to calm down. I'm not fully back. <laughs> I'm not fully back. But they do have the understanding of when I'm in my room, you know, they come, that's my rest time. And they knock on the door and make sure I'm okay. Then when I come out with them, I laugh and talk with them. But when it's enough, they understand. They don't feel bad. They just, okay, Grandma Peachy, we'll see you, you know, whenever you come back out. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's they very understanding, yeah. Children are very smart like that. They They understand. They get things a lot more quickly than some adults will ever um, it's amazing how children can respond and really know where the boundaries are really know when you need yeah. attention and really know when it's okay to leave you alone they just really get it they're great yes right they do get it they do you know and i i they, i definitely didn't want them to feel sorry for me you know i wanted them to still know that I'm still your grandmother. I'm going to do all I can with the strength that I have, but you can't wear me out. <laughs> and they understand and they give me my rest. Yeah. Why did you choose to name your hand or your arm, babe? You know what? I, don't, I was just, I just kept saying, oh, baby, you be okay. You be okay. And I, I guess it was just the nurturing part that came out on me. I don't know. It was just I lay in the hospital bed and after the nurses do what they do, they put my arm on a pillow and I look at it because I couldn't it wouldn't move. I think the Lord I had feeling though. It was some people who didn't have feeling and it still couldn't move. Mm -hmm. I think the Lord had feelings because at least I could feel the sensation you know. And I would say, baby, it's all right. You're going to be okay, baby. So I don't know if that was just my way of telling my arm it was going to be okay. Because the baby is still going strong. <laughs> yeah. I do yeah. love that. It reminds me of a story when I was in therapy, in rehabilitation, inpatient rehab, just after my brain surgery. And I was trying to get my left side to work again. And there was a gentleman there who had a problem on, I think it was on his left side. It doesn't matter, on one of his arms that wasn't working properly. And at the beginning, mm -hmm. he was calling his arm a bastard. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Wow, what a reaction. <laughs> that was my reaction. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. And, oh, no. And I had a conversation with him about that. And the reason he was calling it a bastard was because it wouldn't work. It wouldn't do what he wanted it to do. And then I said to him, if your arm did work, if it actually did what you wanted it to do, what would you call it? And he said, I would call it my friend. I said, that's well, interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's something. So he, his was off of, um, well, what, 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 what was that? <sighs> On contingent, if I'm saying it right. If you work for me, I'm going to call you my friend. If you don't work for me, then <laughs> you that other thing. So yeah. you have to have, yeah. So the, so. the thing was, it, it, it was conditional. 
he had to be doing something to be his friend. So what mm -hmm. I said to him was, what if you just call it your friend now, pretend it's your friend already right. and see right. what happens. And you wouldn't believe it. As right. soon as he changed the word that he was using to describe his hand, his hand worked and it moved that. Wow. And it, and it did that task. Wow. It happened. It happened in the space of less than a second. He changed the, the word. Wow. He looked at his hand. Okay, friend, move. And it moved the way that he wanted to. <laughs> See? Yeah. That, that negativity, I tell you, uh -uh, none of it. If it's not positive, I don't want any part of it. And that, that showed him, though, how powerful he really is, you know, yeah. with his mind and his arm. That was some good advice right there, because I don't know if I could have sat around and listened to him talking to his arm like that. <laughs> yeah, it was so interesting to hear. And then I had another friend who's had a stroke, and she, again, I think it was, it doesn't matter which side, one, one of her arms was not working the way that it was before the stroke and the uh, therapist that came to her house called it the bad arm now let's help your bad arm and um, my friend said don't speak about my arm like that it's not my bad arm we have to find That's another right. name for you to use not do not use the bad arm and that particular therapist got a little bit annoyed and upset but my friend wasn't <laughs> going to have it. She was Claire Coffee, no. and she wasn't going to have it. She wasn't going to put up with it. And um, no. she gave the uh, that uh, therapist a, a, a nice little lesson in how to speak about these sort of uh, situations. And they and Claire already had a name for her arm, and it wasn't. I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't the bad arm. It was in. in in the positive it was um named something in the positive so it is a very interesting thing for me to hear that you would instinctively which is lovely it says a lot about you that you would inst yeah. instinctively name your um babe call it babe and then uh that's an example of how we can get in our way for recovery without realizing it for some people they don't realize that the unconscious thoughts or the unconscious right. words that they have become used to using, how they're working against them. Right, right. Um, even in rehab, they were calling my arm, how's the baby today? Oh, baby's fine. Oh, that's good. Everybody knew to call <laughs> my arm baby. And it kind of lifted them up to know that the baby sounded so refreshing or sensitive or, you know, just, you know, we're going to take care of baby today. Thank you. You know? So, yeah. And, you know, and it's just amazing where what I've noticed since I've been going through this, how sometimes people are not sensitive to your situation especially when you think they should be. If you are a therapist, seem like you would be more sensitive. But they get so, I guess, numb to the fact now that they just, oh, it's just a job, you know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to do, remind them that I'm not just your job, you know. We're here to be a team, <laughs> but I'm not here, you know. I know you get paid to help me, you know, because without mentioning any facilities or nothing. I know in the beginning, it was kind of tough for me because I did nursing for over 20 something years. That's how I raised my children. Uh -huh. So I've been in the medical field. So I've always respect people. I was a CNA. So as they say, I was at the, at the, you know, I, hands on, you know, hands on, but I respect them. I, I honor them, you know, because that it's so hard when you, you're a different person than what you used to be in, you know. So when this happened to me and 
some of the nurses would come in and just, oh no, slow down. You're not just going to toss me around like that, you know. And then they'd be shocked because what I noticed was they think because you had a stroke, you don't have this. So they would just say what they wanted to say. And then when I said, oh no, I understand everything you're saying, then they would be shocked. No. So they insist they don't be sensitive anymore. They just want to, oh, she had a stroke. She'll be all right. No, I'm not going to be all right. I understand everything you're telling me. And then they embarrass. Well, why don't you just be nice across the board? <laughs> yeah, so. It's a, it's a far better approach. I agree. I agree. What's the hardest thing about stroke for you? Really, the hardest thing is really watching other people watch me. Like, if that makes sense. It does. Like, when, before this happened, you know, I, I felt like I was part of the team. <laughs> you know, you could walk in the store, nobody, you know. But now I notice people kind of, they either look and turn their head or they, they'll try to speed up in front of you so they don't have to look at you. And like I said, in the beginning, my whole side was over here. But when I closed my mouth, it looked halfway decent. But when I open it, people jump because they don't expect to see the slur. So when I noticed that kind of stuff, I just kind of chuckled to myself. So for me, I respect the fact that I, I, I'm a new me and eventually I'll be back, but it's going to take time. But for others, it hurts my feelings to watch you watch me because you should, I'm still a person, you know, I'm, I'm still part of this community. Nothing has changed, you know. It's, you very seldom see people say, how you doing? You feeling okay? Every, mm -mm. They really turn their head like they don't, they don't see you coming. So it's almost like they want to exclude you away from them. But I still make them known I'm still here. Hi, how are you? Oh, hi. <laughs> people don't know yeah, how so to. that's the hardest part. Yeah, people don't know how to be around people who are unwell. They really don't. Uh, they don't know what to say. They don't know if they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing. Or, or it scares them to see somebody that's a similar age to them uh, that's unwell because, oh, my gosh, that could be me. and I'd rather not think about it. There's a lot of things that yeah. goes on in the mind of somebody who's, we'll call them normal, not that, not that that means right. anything. But we'll just call them not right. somebody who hasn't had a stroke, perhaps. Um, it is very interesting. What is the thing that stroke has taught you? To be patient with myself. To be patient. There's no sense of rushing anything anymore. Even when I've come back to 110%, I'm going to still be patient with myself. You know, because I watch, once again, everybody hustling, bustling, moving fast, going here. I'm like, what? why are everybody moving so fast, you know? But patience with myself, yeah. Were you not so patient with yourself previously? No, I, I don't think I'm the one that will put myself on the back burner. Mm -hmm. and let everybody else you know so now i'm learning that i have to put myself on the front burner yeah that's a good lesson to learn because it's so <laughs> important because some people yeah. give 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 yeah. and then there's nothing left and then that's not good for anybody because then you get burnt out a you can't give and b you can't give to yourself and feel good about yourself and there's no point um burning out uh and, yeah. and making it about other people it has to be at some point about you and now especially it has to be about right. you first 
Right. Because if it's about you and you get better and you heal and you get back to being uh, the type of person in the family that can handle the noise, that can handle uh, the events, that can, if you can get back to that, then you're a, a, you know, your, your role in the family uh, improves, so to speak. We'll call it improves. I don't know what the right. word is, but you, you go back to your role and that benefits everybody. Whereas if you don't go back to your role because you haven't been able to make it about you and focus on yourself for the first time in your life, then that's not good. That's not good. And sure, you yeah. might go you might go back into your family a little different than you were. You might speak slower or you might still walk uh, uh, at 95% instead of 100. But still, it's better to have you back with these little deficits than to have you wiped out and in the sidelines and always right. not around. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I've learned a lot through this journey. Mm. What would you say to somebody listening to this who's just started their journey as well, or maybe they're a few years in? What what advice would you give? Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up. Every time you wake up, there's another day to make a better way. <laughs> you know, learn. I try to learn something different every day. Put, give yourself a goal. You know, I I might can't lift this cup up today, but tomorrow, if I could just wrap my fingers around it, you know. Just make a goal for yourself and work at it because it happened. Baby was pent to my left leg. I couldn't do nothing with baby. Now baby can wave at you. So give yourself time and hope that it happened. Don't give up on yourself. They're beautiful words. I really appreciate you reaching out and um, joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, I thank you for reaching out to me. Like I said, this is my birthday kickoff celebration. I'm glad I did it with you first. <laughs> Happy birthday for five days time. This interview will go out in a bit longer than five days, but it'll be your birthday. Uh, celebration interview yes yes <laughs> i thank you so much bill I thank you <laughs> well thank you for joining us on today's episode i hope you enjoyed my chin wag with jennifer to get a copy of my book just go to recoveryafterstroke.com to learn more about my guests including links to their social media and to download a transcript of the entire interview, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. A big, big thank you goes to all those people who have already left a review for the show on Spotify or iTunes. It means the world to me. Podcasts live and thrive because of reviews. And when you leave a review, you're helping others in need of this type of content to find it a little bit easier. To write your own review and to leave a few words about what the show means to you, just do that by going to your Spotify or iTunes app and leave a few comments and a five-star review and just tell people who might be reading that what you feel you got out of the show, what it did for you and how it helped you. If you're watching on YouTube, please do comment below the video. I love responding to people's comments on my videos. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your stroke experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor who wants to share your story in the hope that it will help somebody else who's going through something similar. If you have a commercial product that you would like to promote that is related to supporting stroke survivors to recover, there is also a path for you to join me on the show for a sponsored episode or for ongoing sponsorship. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com contact. 
fill out the form explaining briefly which category you belong to, and I will respond with more details about how we can connect via Zoom. Thank you once again for being here, listening, interacting, commenting, giving me your feedback. I do deeply appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.